Uh, hi, this is Andrew O'Hare with Salon.com, and I'm uh, excited to be joined today by uh, documentary filmmaker Stephen Gyllenhaal. Uh, your new film, if I have the title right, is Uncharitable. Yeah, that's right. That's I, good. It's, you, wow. I memorized that. That's very that, impressive. That was, that was good. <laughs> uh, it's really interesting, and we've got a lot to talk about there. We will acknowledge right up top. Uh, a lot of people may recognize your last name, and it is not, in fact, an accident. You are related to other other people with that last name. It, it appears that two of your children, at least two of your children, have done pretty well. Um. I don't know. <laughs> I'm slightly disappointed. You know, I thought they'd make something of themselves, you know. It's hard to be a parent. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to face these things. You know, and I've learned, no, not, not I shouldn't really joke about it, because there are a lot of parents that really do struggle. And, of course. And I think it's... Um, and it's actually part of another part of my life because I have actually a, uh, my own charity, um, which is um, about mental health. So, I, but I but I still think you have to joke about everything, um, <laughs> and even when you're facing really really dark stuff. So I'm going to keep joking about my sad kids who have na made nothing of themselves, you know. So, and I'm not riding on their name in, in any way whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> A ab absolutely not. Uh, I, I, my mother said something to me once. I, she thought I was going to be famous, and she was wrong, basically. But, but she told me that T.S. Eliot. You're not famous. <laughs> she told me that T.S. Eliot's mother was a poet, a somewhat respected poet in her day. So you know, this is, this is, this is the, yeah, yeah, this is what go. parents have to deal with sometimes. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, all right. So th this is a, a um, this is a really interesting film that you have made, and it's not your first. You have a long career in film. Um, and the thing that you obviously were going at with the film and in making the film is that for most people, the minute you say the words nonprofit sector, how close to asleep are they? If they're even awake when you get past the word non, I mean, it's, you might as well shoot yourself by making your sector about non something, <laughs> you know, and you know, I think non, you know, nonprofit, um, is one problem. Another problem is charitable. Right. I mean, I, I'm a charitable human being. How do you make, how, you, wanna, you wanna run out of the room. If you use the word charitable, you're a hypocrite. And I think the level of um, skepticism around this sector, which, which I had you know, as well, um, is unwarranted, but is deeply ingrained in the culture. So if you work in the sector and you go back to, for instance, your class reunion and you say, I work in the charitable sector, they just look over your shoulder to talk to anyone else. It would have been me. You know, yeah. I'm the Hollywood director that when I go back to my class reunion, I'm the star until I said I was making a movie about charity. And then they didn't look over their shoulder because they remember that some where I had a career and also I had these kids, you know, so I was still worth listening to. But a lot of the shine went out of their, their eyes and what they thought of me when they heard I work, was making a movie in charity. And in fact, it's been profoundly difficult because imagine here you are, you have a lot of money. You want to invest in a movie about charity? <laughs> what would you say? Oh, oh, would you, you know, we're, we're not going to make any money and we're gonna make it on a wing and a prayer, so it's only gonna cost whatever. Yeah. Uh, in the end, the movie did not cost nothing. Yeah. And the marketing of it has not cost nothing because we made a movie, not a documentary. I take offense to oh. that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, well, I mean, because- I like documentaries. I love documentaries, yeah, okay. but, I, but I think but I love movies, and I tried to make a movie here right. that's a real movie because I want people to be entertained, I want them to be moved, I want them to learn something, but learning also is a bad word when it comes to movies in a way, <laughs> because you want to learn from the heart, not from the head. And that was a complicated process with, with this movie. Um, but I have to say, I have never been happier making it. Well, let's talk about, you know, you say you wanted to make a story. A story has to have characters and conflict, and this definitely does. Your, your main character is a, a guy named uh, Dan Pallotta, kind of a famous and in some ways, I guess you could say, controversial figure in the nonprofit world. Tell us, people may have a glimmer, but tell us who Dan Pallotta is and why you focused on him. Well, Dan first was a friend of mine. And he was a friend because we kind of 
just thought the same way about the world. And that's really what our connection was. You know, if you, whatever you work in, you kind of believe you're not like that good at it. I mean, and particularly if you do it well, because if you do it well, you have to admit to having made a thousand mistakes all the time. And all the people I know who are really amazingly successful in IMDB or in the world or whatever, when you sit down and hang out with them, they feel humbled and oftentimes humiliated because you just don't know what you're doing most of the time. That's, and the people who, I, mean, I sort of joke around this, but the people who have made, who are the best filmmakers in the world mm -hmm. are the ones who never made a movie. Once you've made a movie, <laughs> yeah. you know you're not the best. You know, even Steven Spielberg, you know, is, you know, it's like, and who is a friend. I mean, I live in the Hollywood world, you know, and um, is, is, is real and alive and has doubts about himself. So, so Dan and I never really talked about what we did, that he was becoming a really, you know, very successful activist and, um, and that I was becoming a pretty successful, you know, filmmaker in, in Hollywood. I had two kids I was raising. Again, we talk about, you know, the sadness of how they've turned out, but, yes. but uh, so it was a lot of work raising them. And so I didn't ever go on the AIDS rides. I didn't really pay much attention to it, but I knew he dressed well for one thing. Dan created the AIDS rides, which were a huge deal. Um, 90s into the early 2000s, yeah, approximately, yeah, that's right. and also the the walks for breast cancer which and, were, suicide, suicide and suicide, suicide. Okay. And he raised a half a billion dollars in unrestricted funds. Unrestricted funds is a really important piece about this because it means it was given to organizations, AIDS being the most benef benefited by it, to do with as they thought. And if you look at a lot of charities, they don't work out so well. And a lot of the movies about that. The AIDS research kind of worked out okay mm -hmm. because it really took a disease that a lot of people may not know, but at the time looked like it was going to destroy a huge amount of the population. And because of that unrestricted funds and other places as well. But you know, at the time that Dan did it, Ronald Reagan was president mm -hmm. and there was a whole thing about it's their fault. So that amount of money- He wouldn't say the word, I remember that. Yeah, he yeah. wouldn't, he wouldn't. And you know, and, um, you know, and I think that money, half, you know, it's like there's a $350,000, dollars of unrestricted funds profoundly impacted that sector. And then he was destroyed by it. Um, and I was actually um, uh, scouting a location in, in Canada along the coast. I remember I was driving down the coast looking for a location and we were in a production van and I think we were all listening to NPR and up came the news that it, it had all been destroyed. He, all, he'd gone under. I hadn't talked to him at that point in like a month or two, you know, and I called him right away, assuming I wouldn't hear from him for, for a long time, because usually he was, it'd take a week or so for him to get back to me. Pick up the phone like that. I said, what, what the hell happened? What's going on? He said, well, it's over. It's finished. I'm finished. Um, and he said, oh, by the way, you're the third person to call me today. I am now totally a pariah. So that was my first real intimate connection with all of this. Then I made a documentary called In Utero, um, which has been very impactful. Um, a documentary, I did call that a documentary. Yes, you did. That was a, so, oof, geez. No, I love documentaries. I think documentarians are another group of people who get treated way less well than they should, which is true of the charitable sector as well, which is why I try to disassociate from <laughs> So, So um, that did very well. It was really about the science from conception to birth, and there really hadn't been an accumulation of that science clearly laid out and had a big impact. So Dan had moved to Boston and we were having lunch. It was quite a few years later, around 2016. And he said, do you think there's maybe a movie in what happened to me? And I, over a sandwich at Jones on 3rd, I will, um, which is not really Jones on 3rd in Studio City, it's Jones on 3rd in 3rd Street on the other side, but she calls it Jones on 3rd in Studio City. Really good food. Anyway, <laughs> um, I, uh, and I said, I don't think there's, it's interesting, but I'm not sure there's really a movie here. Maybe more like a documentary or something. Not, not, <laughs> more like a home movie, really. Right. But then when he told me about some of um, the other people, you know, Stephen Nardizzi, Jason Russell, Roxanne Spillett, um, it became clear to me there was a systemic problem, number one, which made it much more something that helped me understand what happened to Dan, because I didn't really, except it was very dramatic. And also the stories were dramatic. And I went, okay, 
we've got a Marvel movie here. Have you done his TED Talk at that time already? He had, and he'd written his book, and I didn't know about either one. You didn't know about it, right, because I, I didn't really know about them either. Obviously, it was impactful. So what happened to him and what, and, and what has happened to the nonprofit sector or the charitable sector generally is this focus, I guess, on um, efficiency, so-called, and on not spending money on, on overhead. And Dan's argument is that to say that we can't spend money on overhead is to completely destroy the mission. Explain why that's true, or why well, you think that's true. Um, well, Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation, talked about it in one way. He says, okay, you want to give all your money to the cause, the homeless cause. Well, why don't you just go take $100 bills and just give them to the homeless people? Why not? That's, that's what you want to do. That's what you expect. And that's what people expect. That's not just what individual people who are uninformed, that's all, uneducated. And it, it, it takes a little while to, not a lot, to understand if you have homeless people, you have psychological problems, you have physical problems, you have housing problems, you have 40% of the homeless are, are war veterans. And they have protected our country. And there really isn't the support to, to take care of them. Although Wounded Warrior, another organization Which that gets in attacked the in the movie, yeah. um, really began to attack that problem and face the fact because Steve Nardizzi had a father and an uncle who really were decimated by a war, as my father was too. He was a tank commander during World War II um, and was decimated by, by the war and PTSD and the complications of PTSD, which are just now beginning to be uncovered by professionals with millions, hundreds of millions of dollars spent in clinical research to understand it, that you have to have professionals solving the problem, for instance, of homelessness. You have to have an infrastructure to have them taken care of. You have to begin to really lay out psychological help, physical help. How do you build, you know, or how do you do the politics of setting up a homeless environment you know, where you get housing? I mean, Los Angeles is a huge problem. It's, it demands really smart people doing it. Now, there are a lot of smart people in the sector, but they are so beaten down by having to, has anyone out there ever tried to fill out a grant form? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever done that? Yeah, it's a nightmare. And then you go, I mean, yeah, I want to shoot myself. I tried to do a, a grant for this movie. Zero. First of all, nobody would give a grant in the foundations because a movie is overhead. How right. I got here in that Uber that got me here on time, I left my um, drive in the cab and the guy found it, thank you very much, and ran in and gave it to me. That was money. How was I supposed to get here? All, everything in the movie is overhead. Of course. And yet the, at the movie may have more impact on changing the sector than anything. So I tried to fill out one of those grants, and yeah, I want to shoot myself. And that's what, that's what primarily these charities have to deal with. Or you have to go out and beg for money. And I got to do that. We actually ended up raising almost $2 million to make this movie and to now market it to the point where we are. Now what I'm trying to do now, and I'll talk about it, is I'm trying to raise another million dollars to give out free tickets. And we're in the process of doing that. Because charity is about helping people in need. Sure. And rich people, middle class people, and poor people all are in need of understanding how charity really works. And that's what this movie is really about. And so we're giving out free tickets. And so I'm trying to raise money where we would spend 30% on marketing and 70%, which would be if we get a million dollars, anyone out there want to give me a million dollars, $700,000 in free tickets. So we're already starting that process, which is a very complicated process too, because I now am booking theaters. We're in 34 cities and we want to be in more cities. So anyone out there who goes, well, I'm not, you're not in Cincinnati, you're not at wherever, you go to a theater near you, you say to them, I want to bring the movie here. You connect with our team, our team, will help set up all the charities in the, in the area to then help fill the theater. We also want to move beyond charities ultimately into the mainstream to get people to go to the movie. It's a movie, it's not a boring documentary. Do documentaries are not boring, but they have their own reputation that's hard to get. Yeah. Marvel movies, as you know, everyone goes to them. My, son, my young son goes to them, loves Marvel movies. So, so, so the, the, the dynamics of really changing the sector, the dynamics of Allowing charities to do their work is very expensive. And really all money is is energy. And we're trying to move energy into this sector. Dan's making an argument, which if I understand it correctly, is that um, if 
Nonprofits, charitable organizations are essentially a type of business, which they are, he says that very clearly, they need to be allowed to operate by the rules that other businesses operate by, uh, and they effectively are not because of the demands that are put on them that are not put on Coca-Cola or Amazon or Google or Apple or any other giant corporations. Is that, that, that fair? Totally fair. I would say, so I'm not sure which version of the movie you saw because I've been finishing it. I finished it literally a week ago because I'm a crazy <laughs> filmmaker. one of those people. Okay, yeah. I'm one of those people who drive everybody crazy. Um, did you see the version where the, the video comes on at the end and Dan says, please donate? I don't think so. No, you didn't, because that's, yeah. that's just, just in the last couple of weeks. So what we're doing is, go see the movie for free. You see the movie, at the end it asks you to donate so that other people can see it for free. So we're really trying to build a forest fire of energy around the movie, because I think, and I'm seeing now, now that the movie is done, and it helps to have that little video, because it tells the audience there's a call to action, donate, and there's a QR code that comes up and you do this whole thing. Another piece of it is to sign the uncharitable pledge. And the uncharitable pledge is basically the five discriminations that Dan lays out in it, right. which are competitive compensation, which means you get paid as well, almost as well, not quite as well, as you would in the for-profit sector, yep. which means two things. If you're a CEO, for instance, Milton Little in the film talks about how he had a funder who said, you can make no more than $65,000 a year. And he says, but I'm running a $100 million organization. He says, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You should only make $65,000. A question that nobody would ever ask of a uh, for-profit business that was at that level. That's Everybody correct. would That's expect right. that CEO to be making in the, well into the six figures. So why should CEOs make into the six figures? I think sometimes it's too much. But if actually the company's doing really well, who cares? You know, people have too much money. That's another problem. <laughs> too much money. You talk to kids yeah. who from families with too much money, that's a problem too. But, but worse than that in a way, or if you say someone make, is making a couple of million dollars, it means the people under them are doing well too. And the people under those people are doing well too. If your CEO is making $65,000, then your people under that are making nothing. Yeah. And then it means you need to work with volunteers. There's nothing wrong with volunteers, except when you're dealing with profoundly complicated problems. And the thing that's interesting about the sector, really, as I've gotten deeper and deeper into it, it's one thing to make Coca-Cola, which is a product, or even a Tesla, which I believe in. I have a used one, and I love it, even though Elon Musk is complicated. <laughs> but you're making a product. Yeah. In the charitable sector, you are working with people. You are working with people, and you're working with almost intractable problems that we generally feel pretty hopeless about. We don't really expect them to get better. But what we're talking about is actually solving these problems. You know, Billy Shore, who's in the film, has actually, with genius, made it possible that almost every kid in the United States will not go hungry, because he's used all these various ways. And it took a very sophisticated, very brilliant person. You're either going to find them at all the best schools who are not working in the sector now or are going into it, or you're gonna unleash the ones, you're gonna give the freedom to the ones in the sector who are. And there are a lot of people in the sector who are, as I said earlier, terrific, but they are so hamstrung by one grant after the other grant after other grant, and then having to kiss some funder on the ass, sorry, um, but we are in the salon, so. Oh yeah, we're, we're good, so, yeah, don't worry so, about it. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, it's, and it's, and I, I mean, I have, I have had spectacular donors on this movie, you know? And they've had their little moments when they've been worried about, I don't know what I'm doing making a movie. Well, I don't know what I'm doing. That's, <laughs> you do, that's the biggest thing you have to learn when you're making a movie. You don't know what you're doing, so you have to rely on other people. I had great people helping me make this movie. I'm very, very lucky to have had a lot of experience in it. And I also know it takes a long time to figure out what the hell you're doing, you know? I remember a great moment watching Francis Ford Coppola shoot on Sullivan Street when I lived in, in, in the city and um, he was doing Godfather 2. He had a big megaphone, a lot of people gathered around, and I was just starting out in the business, like, oh my God, Francis Ford. And he had a big megaphone, and there were like 2,000 people as a funeral scene at that church on Sullivan Street and, and, West, and, and Houston. And 2,000 people as a coffin, and he goes, oh, okay, everybody uh, go back three feet. Shung, 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 shung. No, he wasn't 2,000, but it was like a lot of people. Shung, 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 shung. Uh, um, 
No, no, go five feet forward. Shunk, 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 shunk. Oh, shit. Um, can we take those three people? And he went on for like 20 minutes. And I went, and that was a huge lesson. He didn't know what the hell right. he, he was doing. He didn't know doing. what he was doing. Yeah. Until he kind of figured it out. And that Godfather 2 is one of the great movies of all time. It opinion. is, it is. Be before, before I uh, let you go, and it's, uh, it's fascinating, people should see the film. There's a lot of stuff to talk about in there. Um, to me, this, the, the, when you sort of get to the level of, you know, what's underneath this film, it's a film about um, a, a, a central problem in the way that our economy is structured. And, and it's about a word that I don't believe ever occurs in your film, that word being capitalism. Mm. Um, and I don't know if that was a deliberate decision. It felt like it. Um, and and in, in two ways, it's about that. And you, can, you can challenge me on, on this, of course. One way is that um, Dan talks about uh, the, the fact that making profit is seen as virtuous in our world mm -hmm. and doing what uh, charities and nonprofits do is seen as a little bit dubious in, in, in some ways, a little bit I, I marginal. I would correct one thing, which yeah. I get caught in too. It's not non-profit, it's not for-profit. Not for-profit, And that's you. really important because I think there are a lot of companies that can be, can be making a profit, but it's not for-profit, it's right. for the mission. So, for instance, Correct. Uh, you know, Dan talked about it at one point in something I heard recently. The refrigerator boxcar changed food. Elon Musk, whatever you think of him, has changed the auto business. And until you've driven a Tesla, you don't really understand the old days are over. And nothing was happening until he did it. Steve, Steve Jobs, the computer, a profound effect. Steve Jobs never did anything for charity overtly, but he changed it. So am I a capitalist? Am I a for-profit person? I've been in Hollywood my whole life. There have been some movies where I've been non-profit, but <laughs> there have been other movies and things I've done where it's yeah. been for-profit. It's, it needs sheriffs, it needs stuff, it needs to be, there's a lot of things that need to go on, but it also needs, the thing is, there's about 10% of the population that don't really have a market. So the, so the capitalist system, better than any other system, not great, but better than any other system, it's sort of like what Churchill said about democracy, it sucks, it's lousy, but it's better than anything else. And I think it's the same thing true here so far. I think, um, you know, I'm a progressive way over. I love AOC, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I also am aware and honor the right wing. So a couple of examples. One is a lot of my donors, in fact, majority of my donors are conservatives. That's interesting. And, and, and the reason why is because charity also is not using government. Right. But also the left wing is very intrigued because it's involving social programs. Right. So for instance, um, um, Bill O'Reilly, who's in the movie, who's, who made a mistake about Dan. But Bill O'Reilly supported and brought in Steve Nardizzi around Wounded Warrior and said, this is wrong. So I have a great, you know, I mean, I don't agree with Bill O'Reilly about a lot of stuff, but I also, I grew up in a very conservative environment where I grew up in a religious environment. So I have a left mainly, except I have a lot of friends there. And a lot of them are Trumpers, and their argument is sort of like, you know, it's the end justifies the means, which is what they used to say the communists said, so it's all complicated. But I think, but I think we, charity is nonpartisan. And part of what I think the movie is about more than anything else is how the audience feels. You walk out on an unconscious level mm -hmm. going, I, th I hope, by the end of the movie, we go some dark places. I mean, we go down to, you know, Bosch and weird, you know, horrible hell and all, and, and all the apocalyptic movies and all yeah. those things. And I really want on purpose to take us down, down, down to the worst possible thing. And the despair I think we feel now, the hopelessness we feel, and the cynicism we feel now, and then slowly bring you out to a sense of real hope at the end. And I think, I think the, the biggest thing I hope the movie does is begin to allow in each person, like it happened with me, because I retired from the movie business. I went, let my poor sad kids take it over. They're doing fine. Jill and Hall name is doing just fine. I'll, I'll retire. But when I got into this, and also I was like, you know, there's no place for me. I'm older now, the whole older thing. And I'm a white guy too, there's a problem. And I agree, there's a problem with us white guys. 
and, and really do, first of all, I got a daughter who's now directing, and got a son who's got, you know, and, and I think, but those were all white. I think, you know, you were talking earlier about how inexpensive it is now to, to make a movie. Uh, you yeah. had a very fancy studio here, of course, that's very, very unusual, yes. very, very fancy. <laughs> we should get a quick look at what, what it looks like. It's great, it's like, it's like the movie, I mean, for instance, the song at the end, which is a very sophisticated song, produced by Joel Sill, who started with doing Easy Rider and has done everything since. I mean, works with Zemeckis all the time. He figured out a way to do that song at the end with everyone singing from around the world with iPhones, which is 4K. Why is that so important? Because it means that rich white people, used to be men, can make movies. And one of the things I've been really aware of is that where are the best stories being told? They're with kids who know cinema. These kids may not be able to do grammar because they have lousy schools and all that kind of stuff. They know film inside out. And one of the things that moves me really deeply about homelessness, for instance, and the fact, oh, we can't solve the problem of homelessness. Well, we haven't yet. We also haven't solved the problem of fires catching. You know, so we, do we get rid of fire departments? I don't think it's a smart idea. But in LA, there are kids who are homeless who go to the library, the public library, who at night lean up against the wall so they can get Wi-Fi. Yeah. And those are the kids. I've seen that happen in the Bronx, which is where I live. Same yeah. thing. Those are the kids that are going to solve climate change. Those are the kids who are dealing with really complex issues and are developing minds that if they are just nourished a little bit, which is what these services do now, will solve these problems. And that's why this is such an important sector and why it needs to be made far more robust and why I think the film finally is about each of us, rich, middle class, white, trans, anything at all, what, what all this wonderful you know, mosaic of all of us, if we can feel charity inside of ourselves, if we can, if the film can help and I think one of the things I hope in theaters, people, I'm gonna, when I'm gonna, I'm gonna be at Angelica, I'm gonna be wherever I can, be at screenings. I've learned, you're the director, big deal. If there are three people in there, you speak to them and you, you're there for them because those are three people that are seeing this that I want people to talk to each other. I wanna really have it be a time when you begin to take the skeptical part of yourself, honor the skeptical part of yourself, that's scientific methodology, but begin to allow more in the charitable part the kind part. Um, and capitalism, coming back to that, is a really <laughs> important piece. But yeah. the other piece, which is giving um, and um, caring, um, is critical, not just for the species to survive, but for each of us to have fun. I mean, I'm having so much fun doing this now. And I'm coming back into the movie business because it, I'm going, wow, there's stuff to do here that's, that's I'm, I'm just, I'm going to keep going till they drag me away or till I'm dead. That's my, my position. <laughs> Very last piece. Would you, would you agree and would Dan Pallotta agree that, okay, unleashing this sector seems really important and you make a really good case for that. There are problems in the world that this kind of essentially private foundation level endeavor cannot solve. We cannot solve climate change through not-for-profit foundations. That has to happen at a, as one example, that has to happen at a global governmental and intergovernmental scale. Do you yeah. think that's true? Totally, I think, first of all, what is going on now though, first of all, let's take it one step at a time. There are trillions of dollars locked up in the charitable sector in which 5% is just spun off in a year and the idea of keeping that money in place is problematic. I, I've been sort of talking about it, it's financial constipation. It's like, let it go. All these billions of dollars, you know, all this money, all this, I know so many, I know because I'm very privileged and white and male and in Hollywood yes. and all that kind of stuff. I know many, many, many families who are billionaires, who have everything, five houses, all that kind of stuff. They are not happy. And their children, it breaks my heart. Some of the things that happen to those kids, how lost they get believing that stuff solves something. You know, and just all of that. I mean, it, it, it not, it's not great to be poor. It's not great anywhere right now because we have a feeling of hopelessness. It's not hopeless. Mm -hmm. But to come to your question, first of all, there's trillions of dollars that should be let loose. You know, they almost let some of it loose during the pandemic, but they all, because they're holding on to it because they're afraid. 
because these people are afraid. We're all afraid. And you know, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, who's um, in the in the sure. chair, and who I was in a movie that I made on chair uh, in utero, um, said, "Safety is not in protection; it's in connection. Having a gun in your house to protect yourself from thieves may very likely get your child killed, but going to your next door neighbor, having a party." hanging out, no matter what neighborhood you, I don't care if you live in a fucking, sorry, mansion, or if you live in next to nothing, or if you're even homeless, connect with everyone else, you're gonna be much safer, much, much safer. So it's all about connection, it comes back to theaters, all those things. So secondly, the connection between the charitable sector and government, for instance, mm -hmm. or the charitable sector and a mission-driven sector and the for-profit sector is what has to be expanded. If we really make the charitable sector powerful, and this is sort of the strategy behind all this, it's going to, for want of a better word, infect the other two. For instance, civil rights and the whole, all the laws that change in civil rights or on civil rights started with nonprofits. Right, and that's LACPs, true. That's NIC, a good point. All those kinds yeah. of things. They were all nonprofits, and they yep. were fueled by donations. And as that grew and built, and then there were donations from other sectors, white sectors, Jewish sectors, all those kinds of things that really moved that forward, drove it forward, and kept it going. Almost every single major climate change, also nonprofits. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the sure. things in the film, *An Inconvenient Truth*, which by the way was a movie that really began an impact. Meredith Blake, who's one of the executive producers on the film, was the impact producer on Inconvenient Truth and has said, this is the next movie that will have as much impact as an Inconvenient Truth. Problem with Inconvenient Truth, the challenge was, it was Al Gore. So it, it, it yeah. kept half of the world out. It was almost, if, if you could have just had Ronald Reagan do that <laughs> thing, then yeah. the right, then the left wing would have said it's bad, and then the right yeah. wing would be doing the climate change and going, <laughs> you know, we got it. So it's like you're going, yeah. can we get over this thing? And, right. and I think that's a piece of this is that if we are charitable, if we connect, I mean, I had said to someone, when this movie comes out, I want to be on Tucker Carlson's show, and I want to speak to all that stuff. Well, he's he gone. doesn't have a show anymore. He doesn't have so a show. You have a so, that you're, so you're here instead. But I, you know, yeah. but I would I would go on Bill O'Reilly's show because you yeah. know, and even though you know, it's like he's in the movie in a bad way. He was also in the movie in a good way because we have to cross, we have to reach across, and I think that's where the charitable sector works also that we're not gonna get our senators and congressmen who gotta get elected and are doing all the things they have to do to do it. But if we can get to the mainstream, if we can get them to open up, then that'll, and it has to only be a little bit. All you need is five or six votes and we'll get things through that we need to get through. And we have to respect each other. I mean, I have to, I mean, I do, I respect, I mean, in a way, I can go on and on and on and on and on and on. You can, that can be, you gotta drag me out of these rooms now, but there's so much to talk about. But it's like, you know, the truth is, those of us who are progressives can learn a thing or two about family from, from the conservatives. We can learn a thing or two about the universe is huge. I mean, I am not um, a religious, I grew up being religious, but I certainly have kind of, go, kind of gone, well, my son, my eight-year-old son, who loves Marvel movies and loves all those things, um, said, Dad, Dad, um, what was there before the Big Bang? It's uh, a good question. And yeah. what, what is it all going into? And you're going, Guys, gals, whatever, we haven't answered that question. We live, in a, we, we live without really any understanding in the James Webb Telescope, which I adore, which is going, it's way bigger. We can learn, uh, we being I am a progressive, can learn a tremendous amount from their efforts to try and make some sense out of it. I disagree with a lot of it, but it opens doors there. So the fact that we go after each other the way we do, or have been forced to go after each other the way we do, and in a way, the battles between the right and the left that go on, and the things we get fed, are not all that different from what we've been fed about the charitable sector. And, you know, going after Interesting people. analogy, yeah. And that's why media is so important. That's why this movie is so important. That's why people really should go see it. First of all, it's fun and it's interesting and it's inspiring and blah, 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 blah. And we want to get box office and then we, it'll be in streamers. It'll be, it'll be in the educational things. And we are going to probably make a TV show after this. Yeah, you and then should. We're gonna, yeah. And what we're going to do finally, I think, I want to get to is something Dan came up with a long time ago, having, having done the AIDS rides and all these things yeah. and have seen more than anything else, it wasn't the raising of money for the charity, 
it was more about the connection between the creation people. of community. Yeah. Yeah, and so so I think the last the next piece of all this, and I'm not going to do all this, but I'm going to pull in, you know, people who've made a fortune and go, what am I doing with my life? And go, come help me, help this, put this together, go back to creating these big events where people connect with each other. And one of the things Dan talked about when he came up with this idea was you're all walking down, you know, bikes are tough, you know, particularly when you get older, I'm not gonna ride a bike. I know we're almost done, we gotta stop, we gotta stop. You gotta just tell me cut. You gotta just say cut, <laughs> we're done with you. We're done, please go away. <laughs> but, but he yeah. just said there would be, you walk down with hundreds of people and there'd be a sign that says, turn to the next person and tell you what most scares you. And one person would be a climate change person. And the other would be a sex trafficking person, right and left. That's sort of what's going on right now. And you're going, and the two people talk to each other. One is, is a, a kid, a teenage kid dealing with whatever. People start connecting with each other. And then a little while later, now turn to the other person and say it. So the idea of connection, connection, connection warms us up. And that's really what ultimately this is all about. Cut, 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 we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Gyllenhaal, the director of Uncharitable, which is not just a film that he wants you to see and to help spread, but the beginning of some kind of a, a, a movement. A movement, um, no question about it. Thank you so much for okay. joining us. It was a real pleasure. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.